Um, as I was thinking through the issues of um, religious abuse that they that the that was listed in that PowerPoint, I uh, I was thinking about one that I do, and that's this. You know, people. Well, let let me kind of build on this, okay? I'll say something like "don't gossip," which is you know a good thing, but then I don't ever actually give anybody a way to get it off of their chest. And this is what I mean by that. In therapy, I was talking to somebody a couple weeks ago, and in therapy, telling your, getting to tell somebody your story is 80% of the process of healing. 80% of that process. And when you go to counseling, you know, they think about this. 80% of what's done in counseling is then just listening to you talk. Not fixing the problem, not changing anything, just talking. 80%. And it makes you wonder if... There are some people, maybe not all, but some people who gossip because they don't find any, they don't have anyone in their life to actually connect with, so they try and make everybody their counselor, and it just backfires on them. I'm not, definitely not condoning count, uh, condoning, um, condoning gossip gossip. I'm definitely not 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 uh, condoning uh, gossip, but you know, it's not a very healthy pattern to tell somebody what they shouldn't do without putting them pointing them in a, in a direction of what they should do. Like, for instance, oh, well, it's wrong to get a divorce. Okay, but what if I already have a divorce? Where do I go from there? I mean, is it just like this unforgivable thing that I just have to accept the fact that God will never accept me? So, I mean, like, it's good to have standards. And it's good to have expectations. But at the same time, there has to be some point where you connect with the real world and say, those expectations are not going to be met every single time. There's going to be failures that happen. And, you know, so that's one of the things that I do, you know, kind of, and I feel like sometimes, un, sometimes unintentionally, I, I might be overburdening people by saying, just simply don't gossip without saying, so what do you do? How do you get it off your chest? How do you move forward with something that's bothering you if every time that you talk about it, it just turns into gossip? Well, that's a really good question that the church doesn't really talk about. I don't really talk about it. Um... But when you tell your story to everyone and keep thinking and repeating it, it, it it's it's somehow different than gossip. I don't know. I mean, it's somehow different than therapy. Um, so you, you, you can definitely tell your story without gossiping. So maybe there's got to be some way where we can connect with people, at least a, a select few or one, and be able to talk to them without it turning into gossip. You know, it doesn't have to be, oh, well, this person's so stupid, and they did this wrong, and they did it. Maybe it could just be a process of, you know, trying to find healing without it being at the expense of somebody else being ridiculed. Um, another one that, I, that, I, that I've heard quite frequently growing up in church that um, is definitely, I would classify it as religious abuse, is I, when somebody loses someone that they love. Well, there was a funeral today, and this has definitely been on my mind. Well, then they, people bring bring up that verse. Well, we shouldn't weep like the world weeps. It's like the 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 reason why it bugs me is because all that they're really saying is emotional repression. You need to not have feelings, not deal with it, ignore it till it goes away, not process the fact that you've lost somebody, and you know you definitely should never feel sad because you know. Like an Irish Jesus. Where's the boy? Where's the boy? I have no idea what you're talking about. Oh, you know what I mean? I, I, I thought you knew what I, you what I was talking about. Um, anyways, uh, and just kind of teaching this emotional emotional repression where you, you know, aren't able to process that. And, um, you know, but then you have to think about the way that Paul, uh, was it Paul or Jesus? I'm, I'm having a little bit of a brain fog right now where it says, weep with those who weep. Uh, Paul, weep with those who weep. And it's like, well, how am I supposed to weep with those who weep if they're not supposed to be weeping? See what I mean? Yeah. So I think that there's a little bit of uh, hypocrisy there. Where it's like I to be I have to be a super Christian. And to be a super Christian, I have to have so much faith that I have to have faith in my faith. And my faith has to be so overcoming that I'm not I I have no ever no no doubts and I never have any times of you know struggling and and and, and feeling anger or, or sorrow. And it's like no, just just no. Like we still are people. We still are people. This is one of the foundational problems that I see with most people's attempts at getting people getting people out of pornography is it's like the, there's this attempt being made to make people no longer be sexually attracted and it's like 
you, you you can't you can't take away your humanness from the equation. Any 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 way forward you find is going to have to be through you being a human. Um, so the grieving process is okay, and it's not a sin. And Paul, when he said that we should, uh, when he said about weeping not like the world weeps, is he was actually trying to give hope, not to make people feel bad for being sad. You know, he was trying to say, hey, there's a light at the end of this tunnel, but instead it's been turned around to say, you shouldn't even be in the tunnel. And it's like, that's not what Paul was saying. Um, anyway, so dealing with religious abuse. Um, first off, you can't ignore it. There's some people who have this idea of, oh, it's a fad. You know, people are leaving the church now. It's just, it's just what's in style. My generation is leaving the church in massive numbers due to these things. It's not something that is just a fad or just going to go away. And um, we are definitely at a crossroads of church history, though. Um, and COVID definitely sped things up, where people are kind of having to weigh whether they are just going to church out of duty or whether it's something that they actually believe in. And whether, you know, they actually believe in Jesus or they just believe in religiousness. You see what I mean? And there's a lot of, there's a lot of things that people are, 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 are having to stumble over right now and ask the question of, what do I believe? And, and the church as, as a, as a whole really is just at this crossroads, um, trying to see where they are and where they're headed. So um, before, for instance, we could count on common understanding of the Bible and people coming back to church, right? Like you could talk and you could tell a story like, oh, remember that one time in the store, in, in the Bible when this happened? Or, oh, do you remember Jonah in the well or whatever? Well, nowadays you really can't depend on those kinds of things. People don't have that same basis anymore. And, and people aren't really coming back to the church. What you're seeing is people who have never been in the church, didn't grow up in the church, have no idea about the church, and they just see it as another religion religion in a field of religions. And America is very quickly becoming not a Christian nation, but just a whatever that means, whatever it means to be a Christian nation, and to, and to being just a nation with religion. You know what I mean? And it's just a lot different is, is happening. The church is really at a crossroads and trying to find a way forward, and this is something we cannot ignore. Um, um, and so th that leaves us with the realization that this is, in fact, our problem. It's not something we can ignore. It's not just a fad, and, and it is definitely our problem. So then the second the second thing we do, and if we can't ignore it, we just simply deny it. Well, my church isn't like this. You can't judge every church. And, you know, it really isn't – it really is unfair to judge every church. But for these people, my my entire generation, they, they've gone to a bunch of churches, church after church, and they are all the same. They encounter, they encounter the same things, and, and when you are in those winning, losing things over and over again, you start to lose hope. And um, you, you become kind of bitter, but then you don't realize that you are becoming that bitter person that you hated in them. I don't go to church because it's full of hypocrites, so now I've become a hypocrite. See you know what I mean? They don't, they don't realize that that's what's happened. And, um, you know, I could I, something similar has happened to me. I've been in three churches. Well, I've been to other churches, but I mean involved in three churches. And in all three of those churches, they were very hard churches. Um, I didn't ever see anything produced for all my hard work. The people who were bitter were always bitter. They, nothing ever got better. And so now it's hard for me to imagine, one, that I can let my guard down now at our church now that most of the problems are resolved. Two, it's hard for me to imagine that there is such a church environment where you can work at a church without it being draining and without you hating every minute of it. It's hard for me to imagine that. Why? Because I've never encountered it. I've stuck it out like I was told to. I did the right thing like I was told to for year after year after year in all the in, in these three different churches, and not, it didn't fix anything. See what I mean? And so now imagine somebody who who is looking for answers, and they're just met with that just mean snarkiness in a lot of older Christians. And you go from thing to thing to thing, and those things that were in those in the past couple lessons about you know um, tithing and about all these different things, they've dealt with that for a long time, and now it's like, well, I don't think that such that anything else actually exists. God doesn't like people tearing up His body, though, and I think that there's there's definitely needs to be a point when we don't allow our emotional and spiritual pain to turn into us tearing apart God's church, you know, complaining about it all the time and, and, and razzing on it and saying, ah, it's just a waste of time. God doesn't like people tearing up his body. The church is the body of Christ. And Christ doesn't like people spitting on his body. Um, so we don't go to church, uh, uh, the, those of us who are still in church, we don't go to church because there is a perfect church. 
but because we are a part of Christ's body and we are obeying our master. There's going to be things that when, when people upset you, when thing, when you don't agree with everything that's happening, but it's still we still believe in going to this and, and doing this because we are obeying our master on what he said. Now, it is important that we looked at all these different things and whatnot, but it, I, I just want to keep on mentioning this over and over again. It, every church fails somewhere, and we ourselves are not perfect, and we are in need of grace. There's this idea, well, my church isn't like that. Every church fails somewhere, either repeatedly or on, on accident, I mean on, on occasion. Either way, there's not going to be a perfect church. It's not filled with perfect people. You know, it's just – it's not – possible we all need grace the same as those people need us to give them grace for being burnt out of church and they need to learn to give grace to the church and get back into church we all need grace maybe your church isn't like this maybe that is true but lodging doesn't win in an emotional argument this is actually why most arguments with atheists won't work you can present all the all, all the right answers that you want but at the end of the argument at the end of the day if you're trying to win logic on an emotional argument. I, I've never actually seen somebody born and not believe in God. I've seen people get hurt and just tired of Christians, and so they abandon, abandon God. That's what I've seen. I've never actually seen anybody... It, it, belief in God is just a natural pro part of our life, and a lot of Christians try to go to go to atheists, giving them all the right answers. But it's an emotional argument. They're, they're, they're tired of the way that they were treated, of the lack of Christianity, in, or Christian, Christ, in Christianity, and uh, they, they want to be heard, they, they want to be accepted and loved, they don't see a point of going to church. And that's something that's important because we, we give all these arguments for why people should stay in church, but they just don't care. They want empathy, and, and they care more for how the argument is presented than the facts of the argument. And the thing is that if you try and defend the church, they're just going to think that you're being prideful and judgy. And so you're kind of putting this – backed into this corner. And if you show them you were the same as them, hey, you know, I know exactly what you're, what you're going through. You know, I can totally relate. They're just going to say, well, that's good for you that you found religion after all that, but that's just not for me. They've, they often have tried church or think that they know what they are talking about and found it a waste of time. They found it to not be a family. They found it mostly irrelevant to their life. And when someone is hurt by the church and they feel strongly enough to be specific, the correct response is not to say, well, that didn't happen in my church, but rather to listen and to care. There is a difference between those in the church so these are people who are already in the church, right? Um, um, th so there, uh, there, there is a difference between th those people who are already in the church, and for them, um, we are encouraging them to grow. Like Isaiah, you're already in the church. So my main goal for you is not going to be to persuade you to get back into church. It's going to be to encourage you and try to help you to grow as a Christian. Mm -hmm. Or there, the, there are those who are in the world, in which case our main objective is to witness to them. And then there, which isn't always through words, and those who are in the church but not really one of the church. You know like what I mean? People who just kind of sit in church but they're not really a part of it. Right. You know what I mean? Like they don't have Christ really in them. They go through the through the motions, but they're not a loving person. They're kind of hateful and snide and that kind of stuff. They, they go to church, but they're not really part of the church. For them, it's a, it's a fight to try and make their faith personal. And then there's a difference between those who were in the church before but left. And, and typically, uh, there's going to be an attitude problem there. And they're going to have somewhat of a, of a self-righteous, rebellious attitude. I don't need the church. I tried that. See you know what I mean? That just that kind of standoffish attitude, and um, so the, there's these different categories of people, and not everybody can be dealt with the same way. And a lot of times in the past, churches have just, have tried to put them all into one group. You know, oh well, you know, uh, I, I'm trying to save the lost. Well, which category of the lost? The people that were that were in the church that left, or the people that have never known the church? Those are two different people groups that are going to respond totally different to how you're trying to talk to them, trying to witness to them. And I think that we would do well to remember that not everybody fits in a box. When you're talking to somebody, you need to listen and really listen to what they're saying to see where they fit in. Are they in the church? Do they go to church but aren't really the church? Have they never been in the church? Or did they used to be in the church and then left? You won't win arguments with words 
w w with people who have been hurt and they've left the church, my generation that's left the church, you aren't going to win their win an argument with them to get them back into the church by having all the right words. By and which is good because most of my generation is nearly retarded when it comes to having all the right answers. We 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 don't like being in front of people, so it's it's totally fine. Um, and, that's, and that's good because you aren't going to win, win that way anyways. You, you'll do it by having purpose, by service, by love, and by acceptance. There's an old saying that I think fits this very well. People don't care how much you know if they don't know how much you care. You you, you love, but it isn't up to you to change them. See, you, you don't change people. And if they don't if they don't accept your love by changing, that's not really your fault. You keep on loving them, and it's up to them to change. You can't make somebody change. You can't make somebody accept the truth any more than Paul could back in the day. I remember there was one story in Acts that I was reading where he's trying to tell, trying to talk to these Jews uh, for a couple days, and they just won't hear it. So he says, "Fine then," and he goes to the goes to the Gentiles and he says, "Keep yourself." Well, I didn't say it like that, but you know, uh, there there will be those who want to hear. I, sometimes it gets kind of irritating to face a bunch of rejection, but you have to remember that there are going to be those who hear. Um, you, you don't have to – you are not responsible for those who don't want to hear or change, but don't be the reason that somebody doesn't want to hear or change. You can show how a church is needed or commanded a hundred times over. You can deny that the problem exists. You can stand on the Bible in faith, but they won't care, especially if your attitude is combative and argumentative rather than being gentle and understanding and really trying to connect with them as a person. Uh, see, there's this idea in the church that, that well, you know, uh, you just got to speak the truth. You got to confront it. Love, loving somebody isn't having an unwise confrontation that is loud and offensive. Well, it's what the, what the prophets used to do. Well, is it though? Is it though? Because I remember reading the prophets and almost all of those prophets were actually given to people who were God's people and not the world. So then there's also the issue that they weren't just angry people yelling. And there's a lot of other things. But in, in our in the last generation, they had this idea that, you know, to be a prophet was to speak was to show people love by talking down to them and, and making them feel like crap and, you know, making them see their sins and, and making them change. And it's like, okay, you don't change people, God does. And that's not really how people come to the knowledge of Christ, so you know you kind of need to have a little bit more wisdom intact to that. So if, if you say my church isn't like that, it just proves that your church is like that, and it comes off as you being a douche. That, that's all that happens. Oh well, well, my church isn't like that. Okay, so that's exactly the kind of thing that those kind of churches would say. We aren't the problem. And for somebody who's already gone from church to church to church, the, a wall that they're going to hear is, ah, you're part of the problem too. See what I mean? It's a little bit of a, what's it called, a um, paradox? And so you can't fix it without God. Many, now here's the funny thing. Many people are trying to change how the, how the church is right now. But they're trying to do it without the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And they're trying to do it without really even believing in the Bible. And they're doing it without having the mind of Christ. They're saying, okay, yeah, Christians have a problem, the church has a problem, and I'm going to fix it. But I'm not going to stand on the truth of the Bible and... You know, I'm not going to try and get the mind of Christ. I'm just going to fix it single-handedly. It's like, how are you going to do that? It's pointless and impossible to solve Christianity's problem when you don't care about the church, A, and when you don't do it God's ways. It's completely Im impossible and just, just foolish. Try, and imagine this, trying to solve Christianity's problem without Christianity. Goodness sakes, how silly. So that takes us to um, a little bit, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the religious trauma that I've had to deal with that I think many people, other people relate. I don't think that what I've gone through is all that um, specific to me. First off, my greatest hurts were from those who called themselves Christians. And I think a lot of my generation are, are like that. We're, honestly, the, our greatest hurts were suffered by friendly fire. Um, I, 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 but the thing is, the more I got to thinking about this, the more I'm not so sure that they actually were Christian or not. I'm not convinced. I'm not. I'm not fully convinced that all those people who hurt me so bad were actually Christian. Some of them, some of them probably were at least at one one point. But this is what I'm getting at. I suspect that none of them were, based on their actions, their words, and their attitudes. See, when somebody doesn't act like Christ, they have a hateful attitude. When they say hateful things, and when they don't live in such a way to sac as sacrifice to other people. Are they really Christian? I don't know. I was reading in First John, and he said that the mark of loving God was sacrificing yourself for others, just as Christ sacrificed himself for you. 
Think about that. That's overwhelming if you think about it. I'm not convinced that those people were Christian. Maybe they went to church. Maybe they knew all the Christian jargon and, and how to be religious, but I'm not so convinced that they are. And now obviously I'm not the gatekeeper, but hateful Christians are a bit of a paradox. Maybe, maybe they were Christians and they were just asleep. You know what I mean? They just weren't really growing. And I can't, I, I can't hold the church as a whole. I can't hold, hold it against the church as a whole or God because I was mistreated by people who didn't love or care for me or the church or Jesus. I can't, I can't hold that against God or the church. That was their problem. They were the ones who, who, who were guilty in sin, not all of the church. And you, you might say when I said this for a long time too, well, I was – the whole church was like that, and I've been in churches like that. I definitely do understand. But that doesn't mean that all the churches, that means that you were in a church, in a club that called itself a church. And that's totally different. These people, they were contentious and divisive troublemakers. They were snide gossips. They burned me and a lot of other people that I knew out of church. And they are actually a fantastic example of what's wrong with the church today. The danger... Well, there's a lot of dangers. First off, there's a danger in thinking, well, we just have to get all those people out of the church. If you get big, turn into the kind of church that just starts throwing people out left and right because they don't match up to your standards, be real careful. Eventually, you're going to become one of those mean, nasty people who can't tolerate anybody. There needs to be some kind of for sure guideline. Now, Romans talks about this. It says when there's a, when there's a contentious or divisive person, give them a warning and then a second one, and then after that, have nothing to do with them. See, and I think there's, there needs to be some kind of one-on-one -on -one dialogue because a lot of these mean, nasty Christians haven't, haven't actually ever had anybody talk to them and say, you know, you aren't much like Christ. You're kind of a pain in the butt. Most of the time, people don't talk to them. They just kind of either ignore them or join them in gossip. Well, how are they supposed to know? Um, the danger is this is what they're all doing wrong without ever stopping to analyze me. What am I doing wrong? wrong? Now, one or two of these things that we've looked over at the, over the past couple weeks, a church doing one or two of these things occasionally isn't that big. But when people with crappy attitudes who do nothing to help others and say stupid things all the time continually kill the Christian witness, that's too much. They, they don't care either about the church or anything and and then they act like they are martyrs because people don't like them oh i'm just you know suffering for jesus it's like no you're not suffering for jesus you were used by satan to cause a lot of problems in the church and now you're suffering this from your own stupidity you know and so now here we are today where i have this daily struggle of not becoming a bitter person and it's going to be something i struggle for the rest of my life with I also have lots of emotional baggage. I have nightmares and panic attacks about heaven, the rapture, the end times, certain books of the Bible. There are entire books of the Bible that I don't like reading because of this. That's emotional baggage. I did my best back then, and I did better than any – that's the thing that really blows me away. All these people that, that put all these laws and rules on me, I did better than any of them. They never stopped to say, what about, your, what, what about you doing wrong? They were only convinced about making sure that I did everything right, and I did better than any of them. But I knew in my heart that it wasn't good enough, and it was so discouraging because nobody accepted me. They wanted me to, do, to, to follow all these rules, so they didn't accept me. Then I felt like God didn't accept me because I wasn't good enough. So I felt like nobody was accepting me, and it was just a totally unfair representation of the gospel. And uh, no matter how hard you work, it won't be good enough for you either. At the end of the day, you have to come to grips with the fact that your works will not endear you to God. You coming to God and, and, and just accepting his grace and submitting yourself to him, that will endear you to him. If God isn't enough for those people who are so mean, and grace isn't enough, nothing you do will be. For me, salvation was entirely by works, and I was convinced that even though God wasn't enough for them, somehow I would be good enough to be enough for them, and I wasn't. And finding out God wasn't impressed and didn't require the perfection that I was seeking after was very depressing, and then it was very encouraging. But I was still left with the feeling that nothing was ever good enough, and that's sometimes something that I still struggle with. And I find it very unlikely that I'll ever get over that, 
unless somehow God intervenes. So out, after all these things, why didn't I leave the church? I keep looking over this from the perspective of my generation, how everybody else, not everybody else, but how so many more of my generation has left the church. And I keep asking myself the question, what stopped me? Why didn't I ever leave the church? And I have no good reason. Luck? I don't know. I, at the time, I, I was trying to do it, you know, to get closer to God. I was trying to be good enough so that God would hear me and answer my prayers and stuff. And I don't know. Maybe just circumstances prevented me from leaving the church. Maybe I, you know, I don't know. It, it would be easy to say something real prideful and snarky like I was just more spiritual than all of them. But I know it's not true. I, I know it's not true. Is my faith in the perfection of people and how the church will always do right, or is my faith in God? And I think that a lot of times people leave the church after going through all this religious abuse because their faith is too baby to really be in God. It was based maybe on people or on a feeling or or, or something like that, and they never really had the time to grow. And uh, we have to, uh, whenever we're talking about this kind of stuff, we do have to accept the fact that there are going to be some times and some situations where people are going to fall away from the church or not, accept the, ex, or not accept the faith, and you had nothing to do with it. It wasn't because you weren't good enough or you didn't have all the right answers. It was just... That's just the way it was. Imagine this. Not everybody accepted the message of Jesus. Surely you would know that they wouldn't accept yours. I assumed it was my fault rather than seeing that they were not acting like God commanded them to. Somebody's mean and bitter and nasty. Oh, it must be my fault. Then I grew angry and then I grew bitter at them. And people in those circumstances don't stand a chance. They, they've dealt with a church that has been angry and mean and bitter for so many years. They think that that's what the church is. They, they don't know what the real church is. And that leaves us with something that I'm going to build on next week a lot stronger. We have to change things. We have to change things. We can't leave the church as it is and just accept the way that the last generation founded it. We have, there's got to be some way that we can re-sculpt it. And I'll build more on that next week, so... Hold on to your butts. So um, mental health, depression, anxiety, all these things were ridiculed and made even worse in a lot of situations. Um, I was overworked to burnout, expected to be perfect, given lists of rules from people who couldn't be told what to do, criticized for everything, never praised, given burdens impossible to carry without anybody ever helping. That's you know one of the things that this generation, this is where they're coming from. I know because I've listened to them and – they say a lot of the same things that I myself have felt. And it's something that, like I say, we can't ignore, we can't deny it. This is the reality of the situation. But everybody has pain. Everybody has pain. They just have it from different sources. That's a very simple truth that for whatever reason we never really acknowledge. Everybody has pain. They just have it from different sources. We can't be bitter that we experienced pain and how unfair it was that we experienced pain. We have to keep pushing towards God with our pain. Trusting in God with our pain. We have to navigate the twisty road ahead and not give up and refuse to go forward. Sorry. We have to navigate the twisty road ahead, not give up, and not... I'm saying this wrong. And not refuse to go forward just because of what somebody else did. And at the end of the day, if I'm honest with myself about my own bitterness, it's just another form of pride. Sometimes we have pride like this. I'm so great. Other times we have pride like this. I'm not good enough. Another time we have pride like, pride like this. This is all their fault. It's all pride. None, the emphasis isn't on God at all. It's on me. And um, so a lot of times people show their pride by how they how they act superior, and that's that's something that we do have to have to come to grips with. 
It did. Um, just a second. Where is that? All you were gonna say? Yeah. Okay. My my thoughts on therapists. What's yeah. your thoughts on therapists? It depends what you're doing. Like, for my brother, he just sits in his room all day. My mom's like, here, you're the therapist. And then so he's just like making all this hooligan nonsense. Like, oh, I sit in my room all day and play video games. He'll talk to me. What? Well, I don't really think that that is the therapist's fault. I think that's more of the individual's yeah, fault. But, but, the, but the thing is, therapists don't know both sides of like the thing. Like, and then she'll be like, she'll be telling them something, but she won't know what's actually happening. This is... Well, there's a few things to realize. First off, therapists are not intercessors. They're not supposed to know the whole story. They're supposed to help you um, to have someone to talk it out with and then to find a way forward. Which most of the time therapists don't come up with the solution themselves. They try and get you to find, come up with the solution so that you'll own it more. Good therapists. Good therapists. Now that takes me to my second point. Not all therapists are equal. Not all therapists are equal. There are good therapists and there are bad therapists. And unfortunately the bad therapists far outnumber the good therapists. By a lot. And those bad therapists get a really bad name for all therapists when the truth is that you just have to find a better therapist yeah. that that that's <laughs> that's all the way <laughs> that's all, all there is to it um i'm, I'm not going to blame a therapist though for for you know for that situation <laughs> so uh I, yeah i i I, uh, I think therapists are good you just got to find the right one and that's the real trick. <laughs> that's the that's the real trick. So, but uh, yeah. Any other uh, questions or comments? No. You got anything else to say? No. Gracie, were you gonna say something? No, I think I think therapists and counselors are really good to have as long as they're good ones. Yeah. Oh, would you say that they have to be? They have to be Christian. I would or? say it sure as heck helps when you have a when you have a therapist who's on the same coming from the same yeah. um viewpoint as you are it's a lot harder for a christian to get their help from a therapist from like let's say if the therapist is like let's say for instance atheist with vengeance I have one. I have one that's like this. Yeah, see what i mean like they're, they're not gonna they're not gonna really hear you real good off but here's the thing if somebody if a therapist does their job right you'll never know if they're an atheist or a christian because a therapist's job is not to persuade you to do anything. It's simply to listen and help you to find a solution. Yeah. So if they do their job right, you'll never find out what religion they are. The problem is most of them don't do their job right. And that takes us back to the first to the thing that I said earlier. It's not about whether therapists are bad, but finding the right one. <laughs> yes. So, anything else?